Previously on the history and evolution of Dragon Ball games. We continue this series with Budokai Tenkaichi, and then Dragon Ball got weird. But from that weirdness, a new series was born. A series that persisted all the way up to the 3DS. As Budokai ended its era on the PlayStation 2, Bandai was getting more adventurous with their Dragon Ball license and started partnering up with developers and publishers who specialized on something called TV games. These were essentially minigame consoles you would buy the system and the game already came included with it. All you had to do was plug it into the TV. And it started with something from handheld games and Jack specific called, well, Dragon Ball Z TV game. Doesn't get more descriptive than that. This Shenron joystick was also the console itself and it came with three Dragon Ball Z games, or rather, three game modes. It's hard to call each one of these an actual game. First we had Pong, but each character can throw fireballs. Then we had a very basic version of Butoden, and finally a pinball game that was surprisingly good. And from there Bandai started publishing these types of games more often by partnering up with another developer, Let's Play TV, who released a total of four games in a series called Battle Taikan Kamehameha. The game consoles came with something they called the Dragon Band, a couple of velcro bands that you would wrap around your fingers, and these are basically your controllers. After wrapping them around your fingers, you use them to control your character in-game. Using motion, you can throw punches, blocks and throw fireballs, even do kamehameha motions. And you play a set of levels on rails that you need to clear one after the other. This series had a total of four games with the same basic premise. The second game added characters and more minigames, the third game added a scouter to the accessories, and the fourth game was a crossover between Dragon Ball and One Piece and used characters from both series. Pretty weird, right? Why am I even talking about these games? Compared to what we're getting on the PlayStation 2, they were already outdated. Well, while these games ended up going nowhere, our next series, which you would probably call just as weird as this one, actually sprouted something that is beloved by a subsection of this community to this day. What would later become the Dragon Ball Hero series started off as Data Cardass. Having wrapped up development of Budokai 3, developer Dimps moved on to arcade games. Arcade games using collectible cards. And these things were all over Japan, from shops to vending machines. First you would buy a card pack, the cards would give you playable characters in the arcade machines, where you would play a series of different minigames using the same engine as Budokai did on the PlayStation 2. They looked really good for arcade games. And every year Dimps released a brand new game with brand new card packs constantly flowing. And this went on for more than 5 years. By year 6, the series changed quite a bit, but it's too soon to talk about that. For now, just remember that from this arcade game exclusive to Japan, a new series would be born in the future. In 2005, Bandai formed a new partnership with a new developer, Spike, known nowadays as Spike Chunsoft, after the fusion back in 2012. And from this brand new partnership, a new series was born on the PlayStation 2, Budokai Tenkaichi. Dragon Ball Z Budokai Tenkaichi. Everything else was just training. This new series would shift Dragon Ball from a 2.5D plane to full 3D stages, using a brand new engine for its combat. So why was it called Budokai again if it had nothing to do with the previous games? Well, actually in Japan, it wasn't called Budokai Tenkaichi at all. That was a move from Atari when publishing the game in the US. Since Budokai games had so many fans, Atari was hoping to bring some of those fans along for this new series. And it didn't stop at the title. A lot of the sound effects and music were recycled from the Budokai series in the US version, trying to establish this as the natural continuation of the Budokai series. But, misleading or not, there was a lot of new impressive stuff with Budokai Tenkaichi. The roster was bigger than than ever before. It featured not only characters that we weren't used to play as, but also transformations and forms that had not been playable in previous Dragon Ball games. The amount of fan service was through the roof. The game was fast, as a Dragon Ball game should be. You would be dashing across the stage at all times. And even though the game had a lot of buttons and a lot of complex systems, it was really easy to get into once you figured out how to do combos and special attacks. This did make the game very hard to master because of all its complex systems. But on the surface, for the casual Dragon Ball fan, you could make the explosions happen if you wanted to. The game was a great success, so of course, they had to make another one. Budokai Tenkaichi 2 expanded the already crazy roster of the first game into an even bigger roster. It gave us more fan service, selling even more copies, releasing not only on the PlayStation 2, but also on the Wii as a launch title. Budokai Tenkaichi 2 became the best-selling Bandai Namco game of 2006. 
And then Budokai Tenkaichi 3 went absolutely nuts with the roster size, with a total of 161 characters. It sold about as much as the second game, but reviews were actually a lot less positive. Playing through the Dragon Ball story was getting really old at this point, and if you think about it, Dragon Ball games worked like this for a while now. They would reinvent the game, launching a new series, and then every year they would release the same game slightly updated, and critics were getting fed up. Nevertheless, with such a complete roster, it became a fan favorite, and to this day, it's still one of the community's favorite Dragon Ball games. Around the time of Budokai Tenkaichi 2, Super Dragon Ball Z also came out for the PlayStation 2, another 2.5D fighting game very different from the previous Budokai games though. But you know what? It wasn't that bad. But unfortunately for the developer Crafts and Meister, Budokai Tenkaichi was already established as the next Dragon Ball game on the PlayStation 2. So that was the first and the last Dragon Ball game Crafts and Meister developed. However, this new partnership with Bandai Namco would have them develop other anime games over the coming years. As for the original Budokai series, it didn't just die to Budokai Tenkaichi, it found a new home on PlayStation's portable console, the PSP. Still developed by Dims in parallel to their data card as games, it started with Shin Budokai, which despite the change of platform, it held up really well. The future looked bright for the Budokai series in this new platform based on the quality of the game alone. It did have the obvious disadvantage, you could just sit down and play with a friend, unless they also had a PSP and a second copy of the game, but the game was good. Story mode was based on the Fusion Reborn mode, Movie, and they kept working on the battle system. It kept improving, but like most PSP games, the sales weren't that impressive. Nevertheless, Shin Burokai would receive a second game, but this one would make some choices that I really did not agree with. First of all, looking at the behind-the-shoulder camera of Burokai Tenkaichi and how popular those games were on the PS2, they changed the default camera for the fighting system to something very uncomfortable. Fortunately, it was something you could change in the options menu. But what you couldn't change was their attempt at revamping story mode. They gave us an overworld that you could fly around, and here you basically have to protect these different cities from getting destroyed by villains, and this was bad. Even though the story's plot was interesting, it was an original story set in the Future Trunks timeline after the androids were dealt with, and Bobby D was starting to make moves to revive Majin Buu. This overworld definitely got in the way of me enjoying the game, something that reviews definitely criticized, and sales-wise, it was even more disappointing than the previous game. But Budokai wouldn't hit rock bottom until Dragon Ball Evolution. Yes, a game based on on that horrible movie. Even the title is misspelled. Dragon Ball is a single word? Come on, guys. Budokai lost its gorgeous, cell shaded look in favor of facial scans and a more realistic style. The fighting system was Budokai, so it was competent, it was okay, but wrapped around the plot and characters from the movie that everyone hated, this game was doomed to fail from the start. Budokai did return to the PlayStation 2 eventually, about a year after Budokai Tenkaichi 3. The final Budokai game was Infinite World, which would also be the final Dragon Ball game on the PlayStation. 2. A full-fledged Budokai game, a return to form with improvements all across the board. Story mode even had some interesting mini-games like running across Snakeway, you don't get to do this every day. But despite its quality, it was time to move on. A lot of people don't even remember Infinite World at this point, because we have seen this time and time again. The big guns, the big investment was already on the next console. So at the time, this final Budokai game felt like a cheap thing to keep PlayStation 2 owners happy, while Bandai focused on the next generation, the PlayStation 3 and the Xbox 3. 360. But that's a story for another time. Thank you for watching another part of the complete history and evolution of Dragon Ball games. If you've missed any of the previous videos, click the playlist up there if you're in the mood for something else. There's also the video at the bottom. But as always, thank you very much for watching. My name is Glopkul, and I'll see you guys next time. Boy!